Hi, everybody. Welcome to lecture eight in our series on the trivium. That is the first three of the classical liberal arts, uh, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Uh, this week, we are diving deeper into the third of those arts, logic, and we're going to consider some features of Aristotle's understanding of logic, which is, of course, the basis of our presentation in this series. So let's dive into it. Specifically, we're going to be looking at two concepts in these brief remarks, uh, predicables and causes. Now, predicable is maybe not a word that you've heard before, and it's useful to learn new words. Um, what we're going to see is that Aristotle is unfolding a certain picture of the world, and we began to see that last time already in our discussion of the kind of broad picture presented by Aristotle's logic. But this time we're moving deeper into that view of the world, a view that held sway for uh, many centuries uh, after Aristotle first developed it. And so moving on to predicables, and I should say here the image on the slide is the famous tree of porphyry from the 13th century, and we're going to take a look at that in a larger format so you can actually see it in just a few minutes. Okay, so what is a predicable, a predicable, right? It's a strange nominal form of the verb to predicate or the other noun form, a predication of something. Um, a predicable is anything that is able to be predicated of that is attributed to a subject, right? And that's in a grammatical sense. Every sentence has a subject um, and we are in the sentence saying something about that subject. Either that subject is performing some action or we're using a linking verb to provide further information about that subject. Um, Aristotle, in his typical way, um, purports to provide an exhaustive catalog of the field. Um, namely, he thinks there are precisely five kinds of predicables, three essential predicables, as he characterizes them, and two non-essential predicables. Um, this difference between essence and non-essential is also going to occupy our attention here because uh, let it be known that I am perfectly aware that the critique of essentialism has been one of the primary preoccupations of philosophy for at least the last century, um, and we'll have a bit more to say about that. Just to review some of the slides that we had under grammar here, I mean, there's really no mystery as to what is meant grammatically by the term predicable. A predicable is something that you can predicate, as we've said, of a subject. The subject is the person or thing performing the action. The predicate instinct indicates the action performed by the subject, as we have here. Um, so the predicate of a sentence contains the verb, the object of that verb, if there is one, any other element, any information that you are attributing to predicating of the subject. As in the example here that we saw in our first lecture, one of our first lectures about grammar, um, the subject and the predicate. Our business offers discount rates. Right? So what is the subject of the sentence? Our business. Business is the main feature there, but we're characterizing that. We're modifying business with the, with the uh, possessive determiner here, our. And then we are providing the information that the business offers discount rates. So that is what we are predicating of that subject. So why is it useful to think about these five predicables? I mean, why do we need categories at all? Why can't we just say, well, I say something about a subject? That's the end of the story. Um, we have here from Hauser in his book, um, Logic as a Liberal Art, the following passage, which is helpful. The first uh, the very first step, Hauser writes, toward defining something, and that's where we're heading here, uh, whether Socrates or his talking or the shape of his stump nose, whatever it may be, is to try to begin to define its essence by comparing it to other things, which are either essential to it or non-essential, that is, accidental. Right? Once we distinguish the essential from the non-essential traits, then we can look among the essential traits to find a definition. Just to comment here on this notion of, of essence, as I've said, I mean, this is certainly something that is fraught um, and something that, in a way, it has been a central motivation in the rejection of Aristotle's uh, worldview uh, by many modern alternatives um, to eradicate, to, to get rid of this idea that there is an essence of something. Um, I would propose that we can bracket the kind of metaphysical 
claims here a bit, or at least we can take a step back from them and look at whether this concept of essence is practically useful. Um, if we do in fact use this uh, in our picture of the world, even today. I mean, so certainly essentialism as a kind of insistence, a kind of thumping on the idea of essence, right? Maybe that's not something that it is right to do, uh, that is good to do, uh, but maybe the concept of essence does remain useful, as it seems to me it does. Uh, so let's take a look in a little more detail at what Aristotle says about predicables. If you want us to understand what something is, this is what we do in natural science still all the time, it's useful to ask about three things, Aristotle says. It's genus, it's species, and as he puts it, the difference. What makes it the species that it is? So you can say that all dogs are dogs, right? but each breed of dog has certain differences uh, from other breeds of dogs, um, or that it, various species in a certain genus, taken more broadly, um, are differentiated from each other in certain ways. So Porphyry's tree, here we have a little picture of Porphyry, according to Google, um, presents this um, movement from the most general, um, and that's where we get our word general from, a genus, to the most specific, and that's where we get our word specific from, uh, from species. Um, and finally, at the very bottom of Porphyry's tree, we get individuals, and we'll see in our next lecture on definition that individuals cannot be defined um, in the same way that genus or species can be defined. So there is a recognition that there is a certain singularity about individuals, and I think that has probably important ethical implications uh, that we can only touch upon in this series. Here is Porphyry's tree, and I've indicated on the slide here the three key essential predicables, genus, difference, and species. So we start at the top. Let's take a little walk through this, right? We start at the top with substance. This idea of substance is important for Aristotle, um, as we see in his discussion of the categories. Substance is the first of the ten categories, the other nine of them being what he calls accidents. Right? And that's part of, again, his kind of picture of the world. Um, here we're starting with substance, and then we are differentiating it. We're identifying what is the specific difference that um, distinguishes things uh, that are substances, uh, but are different from each other. So we have here, in this case, material and immaterial. So if something is material, it is a body. And if it is immaterial for Porphyry here in the 13th century, it is a spirit, right? Okay, let's follow as the tree does body, right? So we're taking the item on the left that is labeled as a subordinate genera. Right, so the subordinate genera taken together, genera is the plural of genus, are body and spirit. So a substance is either a body or a spirit. Well, let's differentiate body as the tree does. You can di distinguish between animate bodies and inanimate bodies. Um, we're leaving aside here inanimate, uh, which Porphyry labels as mineral, and we're looking at the subordinate genus living. So we now have a substance that is a living body, and we're following it down here. One more, uh, two more differentiations. Uh, is it a sensitive or an insensitive body? These lead in turn to animal and plant. And in the case of animal, is it a rational or an irrational body? Um, and that differentiates for porphyry between human and what he calls beast. This would just be any other animal species um, that does not have manifest signs of self-consciousness as human beings seem to do, or um, the apparent use of reason in the abstract manner that we seem to use it. Uh, then under species human here, homo sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens, we get individuals, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and so forth. Uh, so these individuals are at the bottom of the tree. You can't, you can't go down from there, right? Individual instances or occupiers uh, of uh, places uh, under the species um, cannot be further subdivided. But we see here there's, there's a kind of chain right? There, there's a structure of reality, um, and that structure can be rationally compassed. We can actually look at the world and identify, and this is the key point, in the world itself, certain differences 
between things. Um, certainly we need always to take into account our perspective in approaching that, but we're at the edge here of some very interesting debates about the difference between ancient and medieval philosophy on the one hand and modern philosophy on the other. Ancient and medieval philosophy saw the world as composed of categories and differences of these kinds in itself, uh, whereas modern philosophy tends to emphasize the ways in which, um, as, as clearly does happen, we um, shape or even form those categories um, with our own mind or consciousness. This um, <clears throat> division of the world, this, this, this picture of the world as consisting of genus and, and species and so forth, is something that is not you know, simply a product of of the medieval period. I mean, this is very much still used today. If I'm in a field uh, site uh, as a biologist and I discover um, an, an animal that I have never seen before, I, I might try to determine if that animal constitutes a new species, right? And so we have here um, our famous, I was taught in the ninth grade biology, this is King Philip calls out for grape soda. Um, there are apparently other uh, <laughs> versions of that, but this um, outlines how scientists uh, classify and understand the relations among various animal species in the world. So we're not looking at simply a kind of undifferentiated mass of life. It is possible on the level of species and genus and, and further up the chain to identify what something is in addition to engaging with it in its individuality. And this is repeated here in the opposite direction with Volpes Volpes, the red fox. Um, thank you to Google Images for providing this helpful image, um, leading us in this case from the domain down through kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, grape soda. Um, so when we see a Volpes Volpes, a red fox, on the one hand, we are um, authentically encountering a beautiful living thing with which we can have a meaningful relationship. That is quite true, um, I would say. However, also we are encountering something that occupies a certain relationship or place, a node in the relationships among all other living things. And recognizing that can help us to understand um, the composition of its body and therefore how better to perhaps treat it medically and, and so forth. Those are essential predicables, genus, species, and difference. And we discussed that, as you recall, through Porphyry's tree and the various examples of scientific classification. There are also, for Aristotle, two non-essential predicables, and those are property and accident. Um, D distinguishing between these two, on, on my understanding, is something that needs to occur in relation to the context in which it is um, presented to us. Um, it might be up for debate whether something is an accident or a property of a thing, but Aristotle thinks that this distinction is vital. A property, he says, um, as we have here from our author Hauser, uh, is necessarily connected with its subject because it is caused by that essence. So this is some feature of the substance, the thing, the subject under consideration that is connected with what it is essentially. If you were to change this, um, it might, uh, a change in this would be the result of a change in the essence of the thing, right? It, you'd have to change one of the essential predicables and that might yield a change in this particular property. An accident, by contrast, is a predicate term that is wholly disconnected from the essence of the subject. It could easily be otherwise, um, and if it were, it would have no effect on what the subject is, essentially, right? So I am currently recording this lecture. If I stop recording this lecture, um, I would still be me. Um, however, I would accidentally, as it were, no longer be engaged in the activity of recording the lecture. It doesn't change my essence. It's just an accidental feature of my current situation. Consider the example of water, which is what we have here on the slide. What's its essence uh, of, of, what is the essence of water? Um, or to our point here, what are the properties and potential uh, possible accidents of water? Well, the properties of water include its being made of hydrogen and oxygen, um, that water is wet, that water freezes at a certain degree of temperature, measured here either in Fahrenheit or in Celsius, um, it, you would have to change 
what you're talking about. Water would have to be essentially different from what it is in order for those properties to change. Uh, by contrast, uh, with accident, um, if the water is in this glass, or if the water is flowing through this fountain, um, it could be elsewhere. It could be doing something else. The Those placements of water are accidental, um, and they're not connected to its essence. Okay, so um, just some brief comments here. Um, again, we're unfolding this worldview of Aristotle, which is which is so different from our modern worldview in certain ways. And we've been talking about the five predicables, three essential, two non-essential. Here, I want to touch on um, causation, and, and we can return to Aristotle's four questions. Um, so these uh, questions include um, that the thing is, does it exist at all? Um, what a thing is, uh, what, what kind of thing is it? Uh, why it is, why it is the way it is, what caused it, um, and whether it is this or that, so how it relates to other things. Aristotle, recall, um, takes these four questions as, again, uh, characteristically exhaustive of the kinds of questions we can ask. So any question we can ask about a thing can be ultimately boiled down to, let's say, reduced to one of these, one of these four. Um, we're going to be looking here specifically at questions relating to why. Why is something the way it is? And uh, we can also say, what caused it? Uh, this question we read in Hauser um, begins the search for the reasons or causes why something happens or why something is as it is. Um, and we are reminded also by Hauser that knowing the facts is different from knowing the reasons for the facts. So I want not just a list of information or a list of properties, I want to actually understand why those properties are as they are. This is this is the life of the mind, right? This is, this is what drives us forward in our effort to understand how reality is and, and what is true about it. Aristotle famously um, identifies four causes, and, and you'll find other videos about this on YouTube, probably ones that are a lot glossier and more, have higher production value than, than our little effort here. Um, but any of these are going to tell you essentially the following, um, that for Aristotle, uh, the four causes are the efficient, the material, the formal, and the final. Now, just a word as we set out here. Um, the scientific revolution in the 17th, 18th centuries uh, really uh, focused on rejecting Aristotle's physics. Right? Aristotle's understanding of the four causes basically became one cause, efficient cause. Right? So when um, after Galileo, after Copernicus, you know, after, after any of the luminaries of that period of explosive developments in the natural sciences, um, when they tried to explain something, they didn't take into account material, formal, or especially final, and we'll talk about that a bit in a moment, um, they focused on efficient. What caused it? This is a kind of billiard ball model. Let's see if I can get my hands in position. Boom, right? So this hand causes or at least appears in this video, to cause the movement of the other hand. To understand why something occurs in nature, then, um, is to understand its efficient cause. And that's what we start with here. The action that caused something or brings about the potentiality found in the matter into actuality. Um, so this would be the action of the person who made it. Right? We learn in earth science about potential energy. Right? So I'm releasing the potential energy of a thing. Well, what released that potential energy? That agent, you know, whatever it is or whomever it is, would be the efficient cause of the change that we see in that thing. In addition, however, Aristotle identifies three further causes, the material, the formal, and the final. A material cause for Aristotle is the stuff from which the thing is made. The thing would not be what the thing is unless it were made of that matter. That matter comes together here in such a way as to produce that thing as it is. Also, kind of moving up in levels of controversy here, the formal cause. This is the idea of something, right? followed by the person who made it. Um, for example, uh, it might be an idea followed by that person. Um, this is the form given to the thing. And a lot can be said about Aristotle and the notion of form. Of course, he adopts this notion of forms in some sense from Plato and 
modifies that. Uh, but this is something you can think of as a blueprint, right? What, what is the scheme that you're following in creating or designing a certain thing? And the last cause is the final cause, and this is the purpose of the thing. It's telos, as we say. Uh, the telos here means the end. Uh, if this were a train trip, we would talk about the terminus, right? What's the end of your journey? I'm traveling to Boston. Well, what's the final cause of your journey? Boston, right? It is to go to Boston. Um, this is how a thing could be fulfilled or made perfect. If I'm taking a journey to Boston and I don't end up actually going to Boston, then that journey as a journey to Boston did not achieve its final purpose. It did not satisfy its, its final cause, right? Um, and I say that we're increasing in order of controversy here because a final cause looks a lot like a meaning or a purpose in nature itself. Right? Something that is inherent in the thing. Because the thing is what it is, it must um, satisfy that purpose in order to be perfected, right? In order to fulfill itself. Um, the modern view um, holds, by contrast, that meanings and purposes are not to be found in the things themselves, and even to a different degree or uh, in a different way forms, um, but rather are imposed on those things by ourselves. Even the, the definition or the outline of those things um, is imposed on them by ourselves. Um, so this is another point at which Aristotle and the modern sensibility differ. Here's uh, what will be our last slide, and, and I want to, again, thank um, whomever um, uh, uh, produced this image. Um, it is taken from, from online. Um, it's a table, friends. So it outlines um, the image, the four causes of the table um, in Aristotle's schema. So what is the material cause of the table? In this case, it is wood. It's the thing from which the table is made. What is the formal cause of the table? Well, we have here kind of an outline of it. It's the design. Right, so the the, the 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 blueprint, the schema that was used to produce it. What is the efficient cause of the table here? Moving around um, counterclockwise, uh, it is carpentry. It is the action of the carpenter um, who makes that table. She takes the chisel, she takes the saw, she she produces it. That she is the efficient cause of it, or, or her carpentry is. And what is the final cause of the table? And again, this is the controversial one. Well, dining, right? What is a table for? Now, when you think about the final cause, and I just want to kind of wrap up with a comment on that, <clears throat> you might say that, well, I mean, on a certain level, if I have a hammer and I want that hammer to hammer a nail, right? If the hammer is weak in the intersection between the handle and the metal at the top of the hammer, and it breaks when I hit the nail, or if the metal is not strong enough and is dented by the nail and doesn't actually drive it, I would say that's not a good hammer, right? Because I have a certain practical thing that I want to accomplish with the hammer. I want to drive the nail. Um, the final cause of the hammer is to drive nails. If the hammer does not drive nails, it might be nice as a kind of decorative piece on the mantle, but it's not useful as a hammer. So we would say here the final cause of the hammer is driving nails. Fine. You know, but what about other things? What about a table? What if I want to stand on the table? What if I want to use the table as a kind of ladder, something like this, right? Um, on the one hand, um, you, you might say, well, that's not a proper use of the table. And on the other hand, you might say, well, that, that's kind of a fuddy-duddy complaint, right? Like, can't I use anything for any purpose? Isn't it really up to us what the purpose of a thing will be. Um, so again, we are presented with some differences between Aristotle's world and our own, and things very much worth, in my mind, uh, discussion. Thank you very much. In our next lecture, we will continue with our discussion of Aristotle's logic, looking at different kinds of definitions identified by himself. Thank you very much.